Okay. Okay, recording in progress. So thank you all for joining me. This is the officially the Vint Hill Roundtable, which used to take place at the Faulkner Enterprise Center in Vint Hill. Um, however, because of the pandemic, we went virtual, and I think we'll probably leave it that way because it invites so many more business people to come to the table, and we like a full table. So I want to also introduce um, my other three panelists that are with me today and the article that I base this on, which I will share on the screen after we do introductions, is called The Four Things Every Business Owner Should Do in January. And I don't recall what brought me to that article, but I found it really interesting and their selection of those four things, some of which made total sense to me and some of which I thought, well, I don't know. <laughs> so we're gonna flesh all of that out here together. And um, like I said, I'll share on the screen. So first I'm gonna ask everyone else to introduce themselves then I'm gonna introduce the panelists and then the article and we will start. So I'm gonna go in the circle according to what I see on my screen and Dottie. That puts you first. Would you please introduce yourself and your business? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. is, the, is the sound volume better? Now you're good. Yes, no, no. Yeah. Oh, oh really not for you. <laughs> so first, okay, good. We hear you. You're not moving okay. on the screen. All right, good. I can we hear you. Closed out some tabs. So my name is Dottie David, and um I have a Mary Kay business out here in Delaplane. Uh, I'm sorry, broadband, what can I say? So I have, um, I'm Dottie Dave, and I have a Mary Kay business out here in Delaplane, and I'm just really happy to be part of this, and I'm anxious to hear what you all have to say, because I'm sure I'm going to learn some really good tips. Great, thank you. Austin. Am I like I am Austin. <laughs> Let her catch up. I am Austin Bedrosian, and I own Bedrosian Cleaning Services. We're a commercial cleaning company. And tell us about your video series. Oh, and I host the Heart of Fauquier, which is a podcast, and uh, we interview entrepreneurs in Fauquier County and promote local business. I don't know if any of you oh, have seen cool. the podcast. It's fantastic. I always love seeing it on social media, the posts, and just who you selected. Almost always a familiar face. <laughs> Thank you. It's fun. You're welcome. Monica. You're welcome. Hello, all. I'm Monica Fernandi, and I just rushed in from teaching some yoga classes today. I've been a fitness instructor, personal trainer for nearly over 15 years, nearly 20 years. I segued and launched a new business during pandemic in 2020, and that is my life coaching for women. It is called the Awakened Soulmate Coaching Program. So I'm virtual, and I've always wanted to go virtual. My business has tripled and i'm here to learn about the tools i do have a business coach um and a um but i am here to learn about all y'all's wonderful business approaches because um the world is changing and i think each of our voices is benefiting to be connected and on another side note i got to tell you jennifer i don't know if you know but i have a coaching group called the round table empowerment coaching table right so I was drawn to your this group name because I believe we are all in it together and there's no head of state. We are all in a circuitous, empowered um, share circle here. So thank you for having me. See, I, I took Caitlin's advice and I muted myself. <laughs> Uh, so, um, one of the suggestions was if everyone can mute themselves while someone else is talking, there's a little bit of feedback in the background, so that might be helpful. But just remember, when you want to speak, unmute yourself, unlike me. <laughs> okay, uh, Chris, if you would introduce yourself next, please. Hello, I'm Christina Chi. I go by Chris. And um, I have Free Speak Media. I'm out in Haymarket, Virginia, and we have uh, digital properties that we write content about living a life aligned um, lifestyle or well, life aligned living in Virginia. And some of our websites are virginialifestyles.com and colonialroads.com. And I also do photography. And any of the photos that you see on any of our sites can be purchased and used for uh, any of your content. So. Excellent, thank you. Sorry, that big pause, like, oh yeah. 
unmute, unmute. Um, I need most um, more reminders than anybody else. Don't worry about it. Um, Jen, if you would introduce yourself next, please. Hi everyone, I am Jennifer Maddox. I'm with um, Pop and Barker Insurance Agency. So we are a local family owned independent agency that specializes in business and personal insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And Stephen, and I'm gonna say Dawn because I've never seen Patricia first, but Dawn, I know I've met you before. Um, welcome to the group. I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourself, but first I just wanted to warn you that we are recording. So I don't know if that makes a difference to you, but I figured I'd give you that warning shot. <laughs> so Stephen, if you would, could you introduce yourself? Uh, afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? Awesome. Um, I, my name is Stephen King. I'm a, uh, I, I run a, a Liberty Mutual insurance practice, um, licensed in Virginia, D.C. and Maryland. Um, you know, basic home, auto, uh, business insurance, pet insurance, all that good stuff. Thank you and welcome to the group. Dawn? Hi, I'm trying to get my video up, so hold on a second. I didn't realize I didn't have my video up. Can you see me? Yay. We see you now. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, I'm Dawn Arruda with Dawn Arruda and Company LLC with Remax Regency, and I'm a local real estate agent. And I'm excited to hear what um, everyone has to share today because I love collaborating with people and getting ideas and sharing ideas. So I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about the article and learn more about our panelists. So I don't know if everybody's screen is probably not the same for me. The four panelists are the four in the top left corner. So Ruvi Makuni is here, and she is going to be speaking about, let's see, now I have to align with all of the, the maybe we should go to the article first. I'm, I'm like, I remember marketing is Liz and decluttering. So we have removing, what was it? Removing the weakest links. Um, and that is where Ruby is going to come in. So Ruby, if you would go ahead, I'm sorry for stumbling over that, okay. but uh, it's like, wow, I have, I'm going down the list of the four things in my mind. Please introduce yourself and your business and we will get on topic soon enough. Sure. Thank you, Jen. And hello, everyone. Happy New Year and uh, happy to be here. I'm a corporate wellness specialist and I work with organizations to help empower their empo uh, employees to thrive in their careers without sacrificing their health. And, you know, after the last year or two that we've had, you know, a, a lot of uh, team members, organizations, and especially employees have been under a tremendous amount of stress. And, corporate wellness programs are essential in, you know, in helping to actually create a cohesive uh, culture within the workforce as well and to support the morale of the, of the company as well. So, and that's what I'm here to contribute to. Thank you so much. I know I just met Ruby very recently um, when I started talking about the educational pieces I wanted to do. Uh, someone that I know very little about online. Um, Ellie Goldstein said, I've got the woman you need. Um, and so she made a fabulous introduction, even not knowing me very well. And Ruby and I have had some really great discussions about business topics and things. So I'm excited to hear what she has to say today. Um, and also we have Liz Johnson, who Liz, I was trying to remember earlier how I met you and it has to be something Fauquier Chamber related. Um, I don't remember any specific so. person introducing us. Um, I just know she's been in the area and been doing marketing and been seen as a guru for as long as I can remember being part of Fauquier County business life. So I will let you, Liz, introduce yourself in a more <laughs> in more in depth than I can. And uh, what you're here to you talk about, a little bit of background of how you relate to annual marketing plans. Sure. I'm Liz Johnson with Mountain View Marketing. I founded Mountain View Marketing 19 years ago. I have a team of seven leading experts. We provide a full scope of marketing services from branding and rebranding, strategic outreach planning, marketing 
marketing, advertising, public relations, social media. We build custom WordPress websites. We do um, videos, including having a remote video studio. We do television commercials and content for all platforms. We work primarily for small to medium-sized businesses. Many of our clients are in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. We also serve clients in Boston, Atlanta, Pensacola, San Antonio, and Portland. So we work nationally as well. I'm here to talk about and provide some insight into your annual marketing plan, which is really your roadmap to vibrant and sustainable business growth. So I look forward to contributing today. And thank you, Jen, for having me. Thank you for joining us. And just because I have to read everything, I can't see all of the words in your sign behind you. I know it's, it says Mountain View Marketing. What is it? What is your tag underneath that? Helping? Oh, well, helping you reach new heights. There it is. We help okay. clients reach new heights. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. And we You're also welcome. have... <laughs> Caitlin Adkins, who I just met today, uh, but she was highly recommended by our Fauquier County Director of Economic Development, who I don't know if any of you know, Doug Parsons. He is new um, to the county as our Economic Development Director. And when I told him what our four topics were, he said, I know the woman you need for organizing and decluttering. So uh, Caitlin, if you would tell us a little bit more about yourself and your business and, and your decluttering cluttering expertise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I have to just say I'm so grateful for him because I only met him once. So I feel like I must have made a great impression on him. <laughs> I, I hope so anyways. Um, yes, my name is Caitlin Adkins. I am the owner and founder of Spaces Organized and Styled. Um, my business is predominantly residential um, organizing, household management, wet transition management, especially with COVID in the last year, more people are in their homes. Our homes are working over time. So I'm not doing so much of the, um, the commercial and office space, but that is still something that Space is Organized and Style does organize. Um, so primarily we are in the home. We are working hand in hand with the client one-on-one, -on -one, making sure that their home is functioning at the highest efficiency level for them. Um, this, I specifically focus on wet transition management. So that is, new babies, marriages, divorce. Um, I don't really like to say downsizing, it's right sizing. Um, so if somebody's looking to move or transition, um, definitely gonna be helping supporting that as well. So it's more than just some of the physical stuff, it's the non-physical things as well. So decluttering some of the scheduling, maybe creating a better schedule, meal planning, um, you know, your daily practices, all of those things that can kind of go into your whole home and your whole life. That's excellent. Thank you. And I love that expression, right sizing. I'm going yeah. to try to keep that in here. <laughs> That's a good yeah. one. I love that very much. And you're right. Our homes have become everything to us during the pandemic. So, you know, or, and organizing your home, I also believe is, you know, organizing your life, organizing your mind. Um, when you declutter so much, it does help with every aspect, including business. Oh, sorry, let me click in buttons here, letting more people in. Okay, so the next okay. so, Oh, sorry, there was some feedback there. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jennifer Goldman, and I put this together as a Vint Hill Roundtable discussion. Like I said earlier, um, we were having these discussions in person at the Vint Hill Fauquier Enterprise Center, which is one of the centers that I manage for our county's economic development department. So if you or any entrepreneurs you know need business space to work in, we have co-working private offices, Great Center in Vint Hill, another one in Marshall. I do that, but I also have my own company, which is Resonance LLC. I'm a management consultant. I'm a certified nonprofit manager and accredited small business consultant. So I like helping, especially the nonprofits, align with their mission and strategic planning so that they can achieve their mission and their goals and new heights. Um, and I love working with businesses too, but nonprofits have my heart and that is where my passion is. So I am gonna move forward and share on the screen with you the article that we are discussing. And I have so many, it's like, where, which screen? Here we go. So hopefully all of you can see that. This was the article that I put a link in. I don't know if everybody had a chance to see it first, um, but as we scroll through, 
you see here the four things everyone, every business person should complete in January. Um, and you can see marked by the little plus signs and bold print on the left. These are the four things that the person who wrote this article came up with, which was have an annual marketing plan set for the year to declutter, to raise prices and remove weak links. And so we don't necessarily have to take this in order. And I want this to be a full discussion. Um, you've met all of our panelists, but I want it to be an open discussion that they're going to jump in and share their expertise with. I am as well. But you're, you know, feel free to ask anyone specifically some questions that you might have about a specific topic. Um, and I, I didn't state when I introduced myself. So I'm taking the topic of raising prices which um, nobody really wanted to touch. <laughs> um, it is probably the least popular of the four things on the list. Um, but also I know as I went through and I read it for the first time, annual marketing plan made complete sense to me, You know, making sure, although I would argue and Liz, you can argue back or agree that probably by January, you should already have that set. I'm not sure that I would do it in January. I would, I would want it done by January. Um, but also decluttering, I think that's a normal, natural thing that people think about in January is you're making New Year's resolutions and you're thinking about making other goals. You're also thinking about what you can get rid of, um, what you can clear out. Um, raising prices, I'm not sure, is something that entrepreneurs think about. And I know um, we had a smaller discussion about this in December and Dottie was part of that. And she said, you know, she runs a Mary Kay business. She has no control over pricing. She doesn't get to set that. And so in, in some cases, you don't have control over it or it doesn't make sense. I don't know that this one is a natural fit for January, but we're going to explore the topic um, as much as the timing. And then removing weak links. Um, that one, it makes sense to me in general. I don't necessarily associate it with January, but it also, to me, is a little bit associated with the decluttering because it's also about thinking about and being intentional about the people that you surround yourself with. Um, and I know, I think when Ruby and I first discussed her being the expert for this category, and she mentioned something about um, workplace bullying. And I said, you know, in my mind, I was thinking about um, some clients and, and people that I work with, but also the people that you work around and, and others in your purview, whether that is work or your personal life, um, because it really does decrease morale, um, having those weak links that are around you. And you can you can define weak in very huh? ways. It may be someone who's inefficient. It may be someone who's negative or toxic or bullying. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to start in a particular place. I think for me, the, the last two are the more complicated Fit, you know, conversations. Um, does anybody have an initial gut feeling or reaction to any one of these four things? I'm going to stop sharing the screen so we can see each other unless anybody really wants to see more of this. And you're welcome to do a screenshot or anything that you need to while they're up. I have something to say if it's okay. <laughs> sure, absolutely, please. Um, in my business, um, the marketing plan actually fits for January because we typically are trying to get everything year end done by December, um, especially some of our investor clients, they wanna get settled by December. So our December can be really hectic. So for me, January is that month where I literally take all four of those things and I work really hard to get all that done by the end of January so that my spring market can start getting jumped and I'm fully decluttered, organized, and have a plan in place. So January works really well for me. Um, and, and all four of those things are timely from, from my business. Maybe others don't think the timing is so great for their business, but for my business, it's great timing. And I'm actually in the process of decluttering. <laughs> Excellent. And I think you're right. For a lot of business people, January is a quiet time where the holidays, everything was hectic and moving along and the hustle and bustle. Um, and then, you know, especially for you, John, in real estate, you know, spring, March, I'm sure is when things start to pop again, um, maybe even more so than around the holidays. Um, and so January, February might be some natural planning months for people when it's a little bit 
a little bit quieter. There's less, less going away, less holidaying and celebrating. Um, also, you know, depending on where you are, there's a lot more snow days and quiet days when nothing is moving or happening. <laughs> Anybody else want to share their initial thoughts about the four things or any one thing in particular? All right. Don't forget you guys are on mute. So I don't know if anybody intended to say something, but they were muted. But I'm going to go ahead and start at the top of the list then. And let's go through some marketing plan items and see what it is you all think about it. And Liz, if you don't mind helping to facilitate the discussion, I know sure. that um, for me, I am still figuring out my marketing planning um, just because as I start creating goals and new things that I want to change and start and do in the year, that then starts to change what I had initially thought about what I would do marketing wise for the year. So it's one of those things where I think there was a plan in place already, but now it's evolving as I'm putting new things into practice. There are um, a number of things that are important to include and focus on with an annual marketing plan as I shared. Um, it really is your roadmap to vibrant and sustainable business growth. So if it's helpful for anyone, I can run through what those are, what those subcomponents are, or we can actually discuss them. It's whatever you prefer to do. But there are some things you want to include that perhaps maybe you haven't thought of and an approach to this that really works most effectively. So we can either discuss this or I can run through it, whatever, whatever everyone would prefer. I think if you want to go ahead and start listing the subtopics and everybody else, feel free to jump in and ask questions or add sure. whatever you'd like. I think we'll start that way. Okay. I'm, I'm not, I think it I'm just not, I don't us. know about everybody else. I'm like, I'm well, I'm just listening. Go, go, Liz. <laughs> It gives us a, a sort of a springboard for discussion, I think. Um, the first thing that you really need to do is assess your current company position. So you want to look at your revenue, your number of clients or customers, your profit margin, your service or product offering. It's very important at least twice a year to do a brand assessment or a brand checkup. You want to look at all of your messaging in the marketplace and make sure that it showcases your value propositions or unique brand assets visually and verbally. So it's a good time to do that inventory when you do your annual marketing plan. You want to look at your pricing. And of course, Jen's gonna be talking about that. You wanna assess honestly where you've been most successful and where you may have fallen short and why. The next thing it's important to do is evaluate your current position in the marketplace. Look at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats or your competition. Something that we see often with small businesses is that you don't have a clearly identified and defined target market profile. You want to know your ideal client or customer inside and out in order to be able to connect and resonate with them. I recommend to our clients that we identify a primary target market as well as a secondary target market. And the reason for that is because different market segments peak and ebb at different times. And as a small business, we're all very sensitive to those dips in revenue. So when you have a primary target market and a secondary target market, you level that out. You want to establish very specific goals and objectives. You want to increase your revenue to X. You want to increase your profit margin to X. You want to grow your existing accounts by X. Secure a specific number of new clients or customers launch a specific number of new services or products. And another area that's very important and is growing in importance today is adding new collaborative or referral partners. You wanna be able to connect with people who can also 
connect you with those you can serve. So expanding your collaborative or referral partners is a very important part of your annual marketing plan. You want to define your marketing budget. What are you able to spend? And once you define that budget, then you can outline your marketing strategies, your implementation plan, including which specific outreach campaigns and components and through which channels you will achieve your goals and objectives for the year. It's important to look at which outreach channels will connect you with your ideal target markets most effectively. Is that mobile and online advertising, content marketing, social media? Is that through video? You want to look at where you're going to get your maximum target market penetration. You want to look at which outreach components will deliver the best return on investment. You want to get the best bang for your buck. You want to identify the specific campaigns you're going to launch. And then another missing link that we see often is you need to clearly define your conversion sequence or your funnel from prospect to client. Sometimes those need to be tuned up. That should be a streamlined, seamless process. So from initial contact and connection through prospect to client or customer, that should be carefully thought out and streamlined. I encourage you to ensure that you measure your successful completion of your goals using metrics and benchmarks. And we advise our clients to assess your progress quarterly. And at that point, if you need to fine tune or tweak your marketing plan, you can do so if or as needed. So that's really sort of the high level as far as components to include, things to consider. And uh, hopefully that will be helpful to you. But it really, a well-formulated, well-executed annual marketing plan delivers huge, huge results. Thank you, Liz. That was definitely all encompassing because I think when, when we think of marketing plans generally, I think people think mostly about when am I going to post what types of things to social media? Am I going to place advertising somewhere? Which channels? But this is such a, a deeper level thought process of it that I don't know everybody does it to this level, which is why you're the marketing consultant. Um, because, you know, I'm looking at this going, you know, the SWOT analysis and your target market profile. Um, and those are really important things. I mean, all of them are, but those are the two that I thought, wow, that's really smart to be doing that before you set your plan in motion. I know it's a discussion that I have with a lot of entrepreneurs and people are always asking me about, um, because I have a video up about, you know, identifying your target market. And it is so many business owners will say, you know, well, everybody can be my customer. And I tell everybody, you know, if you're aiming for everybody, you're likely going to hit nobody. That like you have to narrow it down where we all don't want to close any doors or turn anyone away. The thing is, if you don't define who it is you're trying to talk to, then you won't be able to talk to them. Um, and so I, I think that's really important to assess that target market and a secondary market because I think you and I both know so, everybody has several target markets as I work with nonprofits, you know, is it you're talking to prospective board members? Is it you're talking to prospective donors? You know, volunteers, you're going to speak to them differently. Um, it's important to think about your marketing as a sniper shot, not a machine gun approach. No scatter and when you think of it in those terms, it's, it's much easier to wrap your head around this because you do want to take sniper shots at your target markets and and fuel the growth of your business both vibrantly and sustainably the biggest mistake we well one of the big mistakes we see a lot of small businesses make is that oh gee you know i haven't tried this i haven't done that well maybe we'll do that this year the more strategic and focused you are the more successful you will be and the better the return on your investment. I agree. Thank you. Ruby, you had something you wanted to add? You're welcome. 
I did. Thank you, Liz. That was very um, helpful. I did have a question about what are your thoughts? I love the idea of having referral partners and, um, you know, working with others to advance further. What are your thoughts on referral bonuses or referral commissions? I've heard it referenced in different ways. And what are your suggestions as far as how to go about setting that if there's uh, to do's and things to be careful of? Well, I'll be very honest with you. I don't believe in those and we don't do those. Um, I don't believe in a paid referral. We actually refer collaborative partners because of the quality they can bring to our clients. 98% of our clients come from referrals and the whole team is very proud of that. Um, and no one no commission changes hands on either end. We refer out of a place of desire to serve and provide enhanced value. Um, none of us can do it all, but if you can connect your clients with collaborative partners who can enhance and complement what you do, the value that your clients receive is far more significant and that's very rewarding. But in 19 years, we've never paid a referral bonus and we've never accepted one. We've been offered them, but we don't work that way. Everyone's different and some people don't see a problem with that, but that's just not, that's not something that I advocate for our team or that we do. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Liz. I know I have I have had that arrangement once, and I have to say it was it was approached to me. I didn't make that suggestion, right. and I I found it uncomfortable <laughs> to, to say the least. Um, I I will say I probably Excellent. won't do that again. Um, Dawn, you're on mute. Sorry, I thought I could just hit my space bar, but it's not working. Um, so in my business, um, we refer people, but we don't refer people for money. So in other words, um, with, um, Caitlin, I would love to connect with you because in my business, my clients need you more than they need me sometimes. So if I have a referral in, in, in other words, my referral to her if she proves to be an asset to my clients and it, and my clients love her and they continue to refer, that to me is a very good partnership because my clients, in my business anyway, all my referrals are so important because they're a reflection of me. And when Absolutely. I'm trying to get my clients ready to move forward with the sale of their home and I give them referrals and they call them, they are expecting to have a top-notch referral person that to go to. So I don't expect anything in return other than them being as good as I tell people that they're going to be. So I, I feel like that's the best referral relationships that you can have because if Caitlin were to work out and be this amazing referral person for my clients and she sees how I work, then that's kind of a a good marriage in a referral business is, is what you want. Absolutely. So that's, that's kind of my take on referrals. I refer up with people that don't disappoint me. And I, I have a three strike rule. If I get bad things back, I don't even wait until the third one, the third one's nope. done. You're done. That was no right. Three strikes. No longer on my referral like list. Yeah. And, and all my referrals know that. <laughs> so it is important because when, once you build a reputation, that reputation needs to stay strong. And the only way it can stay strong is the people that you refer the business to have to be just as strong. So. I think you're, you're very wise, Dawn. I know that when I refer someone to a client or a colleague, 92% of the time they hire them and it's my name and my reputation on the line. So I'm very judicious. Yes. about who yes. I refer because they have to deliver exceptional quality and results for my clients or my colleagues or other collaborative partners. So you're wise to take that position. And what I find is what goes around comes around. I was just thinking that exact moment when you said that, it, and it is true. 
it's good karma and what goes around comes around. And I always say that when you give out good stuff, good stuff comes back. So Excellent. thank you, ladies. And I'm going to use Dawn's comment as a good segue to go into the decluttering topic and ask Caitlin to talk about why it's important to declutter your home and maybe how that relates to other aspects of your life. It ties into everything. <laughs> it really does. So um, specifically, if we were just, just to focus on, you know, decluttering your business or organizing your business, you know, a few things that I have um, written down, just some of the basic things. So let's say you, during the COVID, you moved to just working at home. You probably now have an influx of files, whether those are digital or paper. And so really trying to make sure that you're closing out anything from 2021, all of your files are you know, now's the time to, to take a look at everything. All of the contacts that you've made in 2021, are those contacts being inputted into your email list? Do you have outstanding phone numbers that need to get added into your um, contacts as well? Really trying to make sure you're being diligent in January of closing out everything from 2021 from your business. Um, also included in that is bills, payments, invoicing. If do you, are you supposed to be sending out any invoices to, to somebody that you need to be paid up on? to close out 2021. Um, mail is a big one that I work a lot with with my clients. Um, mail is something that most people struggle with, but it is the one thing that will never stop coming. So really being diligent, diligent about creating a process to work with that because it's going to come every single day. So whether that is getting on the websites and start unsubscribing yourself from um, junk mail, being more selective about who you're giving your um, address out to, you know, your bank statements, making sure that those are coming, you know, via electronic now, we don't need them in paper copies, really being diligent, diligent about um, what you are bringing into your home or business. Um, another thing that I have is your schedule. If you're working from home or going into the office, you know, start decluttering your schedule. What does your routine look like in the morning throughout the day? Are you taking on more things that you can maybe start decluttering a little bit, kind of freeing yourself up? And I think it's so easy now to say yes to everything and take on a whole lot, but really being conscious about what we are selecting and what's putting onto our plate. So um, kind of like in the same you know, line of that is decluttering your task list. Um, you know, most everybody on the call is women and I don't know if everybody's a mom or, you know, I, I feel we feel the, the extra pressure to take on more in the home, meals, cleaning, um, childcare really starting to see can some of those things um, be outsourced you know that doesn't cost as much as what you might think and it's really going to help you focus on what you do to make money and to get a cleaner in once a week it's not as expensive as what it might seem and as you know um, luxurious and it's really going to allow you just to like you know it's so easy to sit down at you know the computer and start doing something for work and going oh well, i need to go do the laundry i need to go do the dishes oh let me let me do anything other than than doing the work and so if you're able to have extra oh, support and extra help <laughs> it's it's nice um and it's not it's not as you know expensive or cost um, prohibitive as most clients think it is and it's actually going to allow you to focus on what you do best making money um you know, the article spoke about decluttering your car. I think that's a big one for um, starting off the new year. But what I also want to say is, you know, when you're decluttering your car, don't just declutter the car. It's also like decluttering your daily process. So it kind of goes back to that schedule, you know, like really sit down. And what I like to do with my clients is the first thing that we do when I walk into the home is they show me how they move through their home. They show me what they do every single day, every single morning. and really like map out, how are you moving about your house? Because you'll find that there are areas in your home and your office, you just kind of forget about. It's like a closet you really don't go into that often. It's that corner and you just kind of forget about it throughout the year, except for that one time that you look at it. And so really start to notice that a little bit more and start to declutter those um, areas that you kind of forget about. And then I'm always open to ask, you know, answering any specific questions. If, Somebody, you know, has a specific decluttering question. I'm happy to answer that one. 
And I don't know about the rest of you, but I feel that way in my house that there are these hidden little nooks and places I'm just used to like throwing things or stashing things that I don't even see anymore until I know someone new that I don't know well is coming to my home for the first time. Then I see it like I'm a brand new person. So, and, and I don't know if that's helpful for people like walk through your office, walk through your car, walk through your house, like you're seeing it for the very first time or you're about to introduce it to someone that you want to impress. Um, and then all of a sudden, all the ugly things pop out at you like never before. Um, so I like that idea of, you know, looking through your spaces and, you know, what is it you stopped seeing? Um, just yeah. because you're used to seeing it. And a lot of those things, they kind of bring you down a little bit, you know, emotionally or mentally without you noticing, because they're always that place that you, you know, they're the junk drawer places. Yeah. Um, that really no, that's do. really, it's really true. There is, you know, typically there's a corner, a drawer or a closet that you just kind of forget about. And you don't realize how much of an emotional impact it does have on you until you start to declutter that and release that. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I feel so much lighter. How did that happen? I, you know, I've been ignoring this spot for nine months or so. Um, <laughs> and it, it does weigh on you, you know, physically or you know, emotionally, it does have an impact on your day that you just kind of don't realize until you tackle it and declutter it. And then you realize I feel so much lighter and freer. And I like what you said, and you said it in a better way that I'm going to, but basically is once you've decluttered, make your life so that you're not just filling those spaces again. Mm -hmm. Because I know we do that, you know, I can clean out my closet and then I'm gonna go visit my girlfriend's shop on Main Street in Warrington. And I know I'm coming home with twice as much as I just got rid of. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's not, not the way to go. That doesn't really mm -mm. help. No, it's about containing. Yeah. Well, it's funny because in my business, and that's why I said I've got to hook up with you, Caitlin. Um, I because I have a I have a niece who does this, but she does it in Rockville, and she just can't make it out here. So this is going to be a great hookup for you and I. Anyway, I have a lot of clients, and my my generation is is not my total demographic that I work with, but being a baby boomer, I can relate. So I do a lot of baby boomer stuff. And the baby boomers right now are losing, sadly, their parents pretty fast. And what they're, what, what they're coming to me with is like, oh my God, Dawn, this sounds terrible, but the death was the easy part. Now I've got to deal with all their stuff. Mm -hmm. So it really started making me think about, ah, what happens if I drop dead tomorrow and my kids have to deal with this yeah. house that I have and all this stuff in it. And I know it doesn't sound very nice to say it, but I, I started thinking, I'm going to start having an attitude about what do I really want to keep? Because my family is going to be the ones who have to deal with this if something happens to me. So that really got me on a big decluttering and getting rid of track. And it it's so helpful for Caitlin to go into even people's houses before they even have to get there mm -hmm. to have that conversation with the parents and, and start working on that because it is a lot for people to take care of. And they're always mm -hmm. asking me for help. So again, Caitlin, you and I must talk because I have to send up to somebody. For to all help. the panelists here, if you wouldn't mind in the chat room, put your contact information. That way, if something you've said resonates with somebody and they wanna follow up with you later, they can contact you. Please do. Um, and also, I was just going to say, into Don and Caitlin's point, I just finished a book called Essentialism, where it was talking about oh. decluttering and part of it. And it said, basically, we think that the things we own hold more value just because we own them. And so in decluttering things was, take a look at it. Do you love it? If you don't love it, why do you still have it? And look at it again and say, if I didn't own it now, if it weren't already in my house, how much would I be willing to pay for it? And then you start to see its real value when you go, well, if I was going to buy this tomorrow and I didn't already own it, would I, would I spend any money on it? Um, well, and the other thing too, is that I asked my children who are all, they're both grown and both married and they're like, mom, we don't want your stuff. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> all these things that we've collected that are of, awesome. <laughs> they're the generation of less stuff, more experiences and our generation the baby boomer generation came from more means more <laughs> and, more and more we like our stuff, we like our stuff. <laughs> just and our so, kids too. yeah I've had to reprogram how I think but the the thing that has gotten me really think reprogramming how I think is the fact that I've been working with all these people who have been going through this trauma 
and it's a lot for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, if we only had taken care of this when she first got sick or when, you know, they first had to go down into a smaller size house, we, instead of just storing it all, we should have just got rid of it all because we're just getting rid of it now. So it's interesting. Very interesting. I will say one of the best gifts that I think, um, you know, somebody can leave behind to their family is just the items that had true meaning and value to them that they really cared about and were, you know, they cherished. Um, because you do find that a lot that you go into a home um, and either, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be that um, a parent has passed. They could have just been moved to an assisted living facility or moved in with, you know, their kids and they've got all of the things now. And yeah, no, they, the children just don't need it or want it or, um, and it just doesn't have any value. And you just didn't realize like it's that's actual physical weight, but it's emotional weight too. It really is holding you. And Monica posted in the chat, the uh, Marie Kondo's book, Does It Spark Joy? Um, mm -hmm. And I think kind of tying with that, with um, Jennifer's comment of, you know, does this, act, would I buy this again? Those are two different strategies and approaches. And you, so just because you tried one, like I know some people are very anti Marie Kondo, does it spark joy? I, I have a lot of people who are, I've tried that. It doesn't work for me. That's okay. okay. Like there is a lot of different ways to declutter. It doesn't have to be a one size fits all. Um, and, you know, Jennifer's comment of, you know, would I buy this again? Does this, would I pay the same amount or, you know, what does it actually have any value to it? Um, a little tip, a little pro tip here, don't touch anything um, because it is scientifically proven that if you lay your hands on an item, you are more likely to keep it. So if I go into a client's home, um, it, unless they are adamant about touching things, they're not touching anything. They can keep whatever they want at the end of the day, it's their things. Um, but I will be the one <laughs> handling the items and they're less likely to keep it because they're not having that emotional connection to items again. That's good. And, and you know, as, as we alluded to earlier, as we are now mostly working from home, you know, decluttering and making our homes feel better also helps us be more productive at work when there's less clutter around us. Uh, we're free to think a little bit better and focus a little bit more. Um, and thank you. I want to go ahead and move on because our hour is going very quickly. So Ruby, um, I'm going to let you speak. I will go if there's more time, but talk about the weak links and especially as it relates to business. And as I said earlier, you know, you can define weak links in very, very different ways. I know when we initially spoke, you know, we were thinking in two different directions about weak links and, you know, are they people? Are they processes? Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a person maybe, but, you know, talk about your expertise and what you're finding as far as removing weak links in your at least professional life, if not personal too. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, January is a time where all we hear about is a detox. I need a detox. What's the latest mm -hmm. detox? And I definitely think that companies should look at January as a time to actually look at their inefficiencies, policies, uh, maybe workforce that aren't necessarily working. In fact, December is actually a great time or December, January, because I know uh, Dawn said that that's not a great time for her in December, but um, taking a look at what didn't work last year, what were your strengths, what were your weaknesses, what do we need to, uh, what can we move forward with and advance in the coming year, and what do we need to change. Now, in the case of organizations, I'm specifically going to talk about workforce toxicity, which is the common weakest link, and the reason why is is because in this environment that we're in, it's so crucial to help manage stress and to help uh, your team manage stress. And one of the biggest stresses is uh, a toxic work environment. Now, as far as, you know, when we think of removing the weakest link, it doesn't necessarily mean letting someone go. A, you have to identify what is the weakest link. If it's perhaps a... Uh, a team member um, sort of dive into, okay, let's find out what is the cause of that, um, of the issue or, and what is the issue and do that by communicating with the team, um, finding out what are the problems, what are the uh, pain points, what are people uh, really stressed about as far as a toxic work culture. 
also looking at performance appraisals, but more frequent appraisals, both for the um, individual team member, but also for supervisors and managers. I firmly believe that it should go both ways as well, because we can all grow and change. And sometimes a toxic work environment is is um is often sometimes the cause of um managers as well uh also knowing if there's a specific person or a group of people that seem to be a little bit more disgruntled or or adding toxicity to the workplace maybe finding out what are their strengths what are their is it maybe the job position that has changed for them could they possibly be moved to another position are there some areas in other words basically try to communicate and work with them first before at least letting them go but however leaving it for uh, the moment you see a problem that's when it should be addressed it's very it's like weeds growing <laughs> you know if uh, if you don't tackle it at the start um there should be some things that should be non-negotiable and nip them in the bud at the start because what that will impact is the morale of the com uh, of the team it will also impact retention too and even because if you have new people coming in and especially these days, people want to, people with this very really little that people want to deal with. So that's why some companies are seeing a quick incoming and quick exit as well. And, and also it, um, the bullying that we did discuss too, having a toxic work environment can really um, be a drain uh, on the um, team members. It can also suppress other team members from, you know, from contributing to the team. And it just um, it impacts the quality of work as well. So, you know, just identifying what the areas are, get the team involved, communicate with the team, because if anything, team members really want to feel part of the company, part of the process, part of the change. No one really wants to be talked to or talked at, especially these days. And I think more than anything, it's so crucial to make people feel, especially if we spend 99% of our work lives at work, we have to feel needed and you know, like we're contributing and not just doing a task. And then what I'll say to wrap up is, you know, leading with, a, Oftentimes, a team member does not come in and start as a toxic, disgruntled employee. And if that's happening, then that's a hiring issue. There may be that that's something that needs to be addressed on the forefront. But the evolution to that point, then the other areas to that needs to be assessed. And so with companies, I really do do a, a deep dive and assessments into finding out what are the employees struggling with, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, and what areas do we have to fix? Because it's not usually just one person that's an issue. It's usually um, a, a company issue. <laughs> so, so yes. Absolutely, culture. Um, yes. <laughs> can be something that becomes toxic and it's not a specific person. And I know exactly what you mean. Sometimes I have found and people have challenged me on it. They don't love the idea, but sometimes I've found in companies, the person who's toxic or maybe more than one is just in the wrong seat in the company. Yes. Um, by changing position, finding out what makes them happy and they're passionate, maybe they're an accountant by trade and by education, but maybe they really hate numbers and math and they're good at it, but they don't like it. Um, and maybe they're actually a, an HR person or you, you never know. Um, you know, I did, I managed a winery for a while and, you know, obviously there's very few positions within the winery. It was a small winery you know, most of the employees were there to pour wine for customers. And that was great when there were customers, but then it was like, okay, what do you do when there's nobody there? Or when you've got more employees standing around than you have customers, you know, when you open up at 11 AM, <laughs> not everybody's drinking that early, thankfully. Um, and so what we did was, you know, I started learning more about the people that we had there and what they enjoyed and come to find out one woman give her cleaning rags happy as could be oh my gosh it was so easy i went and spent you know 20 30 dollars at the store to buy cleaning supplies and just hid them in little places that she could find and she was super happy all day long and then the winery was getting cleaner um i had one woman who loved gardening great 
here's some petty cash, go to Lowe's or a nursery and bring something pretty and plant it in the yard. Um, and you know, that little by little people are more engaged, they're happier, they're doing some of the things that they love. Um, I wouldn't have said anybody there was toxic, but it definitely changed the way they thought about coming to work and what they got to do, as opposed to I'm gonna stand around half the time because there's not always someone to pour wine for. Um, and so that became a really good thing. And you're right, because I think a lot of people look at it as you just remove the toxic person. There's someone with a bad attitude, somebody that makes everybody want to hide in a corner, get rid of them. Um, and that's not necessarily the best solution. And it's, it's almost one of those band-aid solutions, you know what I mean? Where then, okay, the next time you have a difficult person, you just, they're disposable because then that becomes the culture. Are we just disposable? Um, yes, and, and you've probably heard, we all hear it, the um, great resignation, but we're not talking enough about the people left behind, you know, there's excess now workload for them. There's also that feeling, another feeling of loss, you know, there's so much that's been lost over these last two years, sometimes maybe losing your coworker that you used to, you know, talk to and, um, and, and relate to, you hear them leaving, they're able to leave and lead this happy, carefree life, and you're left behind. So that also creates an environment where, uh, and toxic can be various ways, you know, it could be just low morale, disengaged, um, mental health issues as well. So it's definitely a lot to consider. And since uh, there are people that aren't necessarily part of an organization, what I I will say, since I am all about doing what you can to cope with stress, I will say we can also look at this time too in terms of removing the weakest link, looking at our um, inefficiencies, policies as well. But also if people are hiring, um, you know, maybe you're hiring uh, part-time workers or team members that you may be working with. In other words, taking a look at things that just are draining, that are just not adding value to you or things that you're just thinking, or even tasks, you know, how can you delegate, you know, let go of some things um, and even social um social obligations people as well we love people we love family we love friends but if it's no longer serving you then it, this is the time to really protect your energy and space i like that too because yes weaknesses you know your weak links we, we automatically start thinking about people when we say that but it's really you know it's also tying back to what liz said earlier about your marketing plan and doing a swot analysis what are your strengths what are your weaknesses and I think we can all relate to that thing we have to do for our business or that we think we should do that makes us go, oh, I really just know not to do or not ever. Um, those might be some of your weak links. And as Caitlin said, that's also a good opportunity to see, do you want to hire someone outside, you know, outsource it? Is there someone else that that thing that creates, you know, the ulcer you're starting to form is somebody else's joy let them have it. It's well worth your money to give it to them. <laughs> um, and I don't know, I, we're past five o'clock. So I don't know if any of you have more time you want to stay. We haven't discussed the whole raising prices thing. So if it's okay, I'll continue. If it's after five and that means you need to go, I will certainly wish you well for the rest of the month and hope I see you next month. Um, but in talking about raising prices, I don't know that I agree that it's just a January thing, but I definitely think if you're in business for yourself, it's something you should evaluate. Look at what you're charging for people um, or charging people, um, your clients and customers for your services or your goods. And Dottie, I know you mentioned earlier, you have no control over that. So for some of you, this may just be a complete non-issue. Um, but I know for myself and, and probably for Liz as well, um, I don't know about Ruby or Caitlin, but you know the services that we have are, are broad. Um, you might create different services for different people and are you charging the same across the board? Well, maybe not because this project takes this much time or encompasses that much and might do some package pricing. Um, but I know that what I'm doing, especially for long-term customers is okay, how long is it okay to pay me the same price? If I've been working with you for five years, you know, if I were your employee, I would likely expect somewhere in there to get at least a cost of living increase. Um, and, and so it says to me, you know, at the very least, start reviewing the contracts that I have and the contracts that I make templates for 
um, to give to new clients that maybe it says, you know, after one year, there's a 3% cost of living increase. Um, or maybe I just need to go, okay, I need more customers and charge them more um, and leave the old customers alone. Um, but I don't think it's unreasonable to say, you know, a cost of living increase would be appropriate in a contract. Um, you know, you see them in, in a lot of rental clauses. Why wouldn't it be in an employment, not necessarily employment clause, but in a contractor's contract clause, um, a consulting clause. Um, and I think that's appropriate to at least evaluate for your business um, what that looks like going forward. It not, not necessarily, well, it's January, I'm going to tell all my clients they owe me more money now. Um, because I also know that right now I have two clients who are fairly new. And I have a few that have been with me for years. So, you know, if you're brand new and I've been working with you for only two or three months, all of a sudden I'm going to tell you, you know, I'm going to charge you different now. That wouldn't be appropriate. I wouldn't feel good about that. And they probably wouldn't feel very good about it either. Um, and Dawn, yeah, I was just thinking about you. You're on mute. Um, so go ahead and say whatever you want. I'm like, you probably have a, a percentage thing that isn't, isn't messed with too much. Well, now that you mention it, I have a perfect example of this. It's absolutely a perfect example. So as everyone um, is aware, the real estate market has low inventory and some properties are selling really quickly with multiple offers. And a lot of the listing clients that we get have an attitude of, well, I shouldn't have to pay you the same amount of money that you normally would expect because the houses are selling faster. You don't have to do well, anything, right? It's going to sell itself. This, <laughs> this is wrong. <laughs> this is wrong, very wrong because... They want to have someone who's going to negotiate with multiple offers. And if you don't have the proper experienced agent who is going to get you to the finish line with those multiple offers, you're, you're dead in the water. So you, you can hire somebody who will take less money, but they probably are taking less money because they are desperate for work and they don't have the reputation. They don't have the experience. And this actually happened to me this month. I had a referral from a relocation company and the gentleman actually knew me from a referral from one of my other clients, which I always love working for the referrals from my other clients because they're the best, they're the best voice for me. So the, the client called me and they said, look, I have to get you approved through my relocation company because they assigned me an agent. She wasn't very experienced. We lost two properties. I can't keep going through this. I live in Arizona. I'm coming out there in March. I really want you to be my agent because you were recommended from the start. And I said, well, you can, you know, talk to your reload company, but I can tell you that your relocation company is probably not going to have terms that I'm going to agree to. And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, let's see what they come back with. And then we'll talk about it. Well, sure enough, the referral company came back and said, Dawn, we would love to have you on as his agent but we're going to take 40% of your check. And I said, that's not going to work. I'm a professional. This is my career. I don't do this part-time. This is my job. This is my career. This is what I put my heart and soul in every single day. And if you can't fight to go back and get a better referral fee taken from the refer referral company, um, then I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to help your client. And this is where I took control of my business. And I had to, because I said, I work hard for my clients and this guy is going to be from out of state. I'm going to have to FaceTime him, multiple offers, multiple properties and fight for him. And he's not even going to be here. So I'm going to have to fight for my, my commission. And so they came back and said, sorry, we can't do that. And I said, then I'm sorry, I can't take the referral. And that's really great that you stood up for yourself. And I know a lot of us are entrepreneurs, small businesses or solopreneurs. We work for ourselves, by ourselves. And it relates back to what Liz said at the very beginning of evaluating your value proposition. What are you worth? And, and that's what you know, I said. <clears throat> some people, you know, you can go with the expression, um, you're worth what you'll take. And I think as we get when we've been in business a little bit longer and we get a little bit smarter, we start to realize what are we willing to take? And it's not as little as it used to be. You know, when you start, you might take whatever you can because you're starting a business and you want clients and you need to pay bills. And then you start to really narrow and focus in on the things you love doing, the things you're best at, and what you're worth at that. And you start getting pickier. 
Mm-hmm. And it's also then, uh, you know, as Liz said, where you also figure out what your target market is. There are very specific people that you really, really like working with and some that you really, really don't. And you start to zero in on what that is. And I think it's a really good thing. I like hearing that you stood up for yourself and you turned down. Um, and it's, it's hard to do. Feeling. Yeah, and it's hard to do in January when you're just starting to set out for the year because you really you have your goals in mind and you have an idea of what you're going to do. But you don't know if that's going to pan out. Interest rates going up. Um, we have uh, the highest inflation rate in 40 years. So all these are factors that are going to affect my business year, this year. But I also said, I can't work for free. And this basically was saying your value isn't there. And my time is not professional enough to, to pay for. So I did it. I did it very professionally. And I was actually very proud of myself. I've been in this business since 2007. My first listing was a short sale. So I've lived through a lot of trauma with my clients. But this was, I was very proud of how I um, stood up for myself. And I hope that everybody else can feel that, that pride as well, because it felt good. We are. It's, it's a difficult thing that I see a lot of entrepreneurs, and especially because I work with a lot of nonprofits, that they don't know how to state their value proposition. They don't always know what it is, how to define it at all, and they don't know how to communicate it. And it gets lost in the shuffle. And it's why, you know, I try to help people. And we're usually worst at patting ourselves on the back. We're really good at patting other people on the back. And I think it's one of the lessons you have to learn as an entrepreneur. It's sort of that, I don't want to say dog eat dog roll, but you've got to learn to pat yourself on the back. Everybody's got to sell themselves. Um, If you want the clients that you want, if you want the money that you want, then you have to prove to people that you're worth and you have to prove it to yourself so that you can sell it. Exactly. And in my job, I always say in my job, I'm on an interview every day because every time I meet a client, I'm interviewing for a job. So I've got a lot of experience interviewing. (laughs) So I'm going to go back to raising prices and it's not necessarily about raising prices, but sometimes it's just about being firm in your price and not discounting. Exactly. And Liz, I'm sorry, I feel like you were about to say something a couple of times and then I jumped in first. Um, Is there something you wanted to say? Well, I was just going to say that when you're, you know, when you're profiling your services and your value, there are four questions you need to be able to answer to your clients and prospects. Why choose you? What sets you apart from the competition? What unique assets do you provide to your clients or customers? and what unique assets do you provide to the community and that fourth question is the giving back component and statistically five years ago that carried a decision making weight of 30 percent today it's 80 percent i would say people want to work with companies and businesses that give back to the local and regional community so whatever your passion is and however you contribute to your local and regional community, I encourage you to weave that into your brand and into your value propositions. Excellent, thank you. I need to see here. That's a really good idea, but it's also very hard to toot your own horn. <laughs> well, well, that's why there are marketing professionals. They'll toot it. <laughs> I was just gonna say, <laughs> that's why she can do it for you. <laughs> You can do it in a way so you're not beating your own drum, but you're showcasing how that serves your clients best. You know, uh, Mountain View Marketing is passionate about two uh, giving back components. We've donated $90,000 worth of our services to Rap Cats, which is a cat rescue organization here in Rappahannock. Um, And I also am very active on the board of directors of the Women's Business Council, because having been in my career for 42 years, I can tell you the glass ceiling was thick and tough to penetrate. So empowering women in business is really at the top of my list, along with Cat Rescue. So it's a way to showcase your investment in your community and your investment in delivering quality. And you can position it that way. I like that. Thank you. Chris, I know you wanted to say something. Go ahead, jump in. Yeah, I was um, gonna say too, when it comes to raising prices, something that we kept getting surprised about was we had clients that we had worked with, we'd do like press releases or 
you know, they had um, different clients that needed specific articles written. And we were afraid to raise prices because we had them as clients for so long and then found that when we went and changed the price, they didn't question it at all. So then we're like, <laughs> why did we wait so long? And then, you know, a couple of years later we did it again and they were like, yeah, no question. And so now we're just like, is it in our heads? Yeah. Well, you proved your value. So you were worth every penny and a few more. And that's great. It's good to have clients like that too, that, you know, that see your value and recognize it instead of, you know, nickel and diming. Ruby? Uh, yeah, so twofold. Patricia, thank you so much for sharing that story. And that's amazing. <laughs> too. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you for that. Um, and I guess Jen and Liz, I, I guess this is twofold pricing and marketing. What are your thoughts on for for when it makes sense, um, and not every business can do this, but putting your prices on your site, is that a, um, uh, is that recommended or is it, is it more, do you attract more people, um, more potential customers in? Um, and I know it depends really on what your services are, but for some where uh, you recommend that they call you to discuss pricing. What are your thoughts on that? I'm, I'm one of those people. I like full disclosure when I'm shopping. Mm -hmm. um, I always want to look out and see what people are charging. So at least I know if I'm in the ballpark, like, is this something I should even consider? Or is it you know way mm -hmm. out there? Or sometimes you look and it's like, oh, that's a lot less than I had in my head. Um, so I do, I mean, I don't have pricing on my website. But I have a separate, it's, I call it the resource hub, where it was a platform that you could put an online shop, um, but for businesses that weren't, you know, like retail, it, it wasn't a Shopify type thing where, with shopping carts, it, it was for services. And so I do have some of the things that I do very, I'm going to say streamlined, um, that would take approximately the same amount of time and be the same process, no matter what the client was, I will have pricing that is on there. But then it, it always varies because eventually someone's going to, you know, start the conversation and, you know, then it's a little bit of this, but then there's some of that over there. And, you know, then you wind up making that unique price. But I believe in putting that out there so people at least have an idea, you know, are you in their ballpark at all? Can they work with that number? Because otherwise, you get a lot more phone calls and emails of people kicking tires and you wind up wasting time. I'd rather start with, you know what, I, I've got the budget for this thing and let's talk about what you can do. I like starting from that standpoint. Liz, do you agree? Do you, I see you shaking your head. I'm like, I know most people don't put pricing on their sites. Well, for our services, they're very client specific and client centric. So I prefer to actually have a one-on-one -on -one complimentary consultation with clients to see exactly what they need, because sometimes what they think they need, we can get the same results for them with a different service for much less. Now, some of our services, we have a branding package, both for profit and nonprofit companies with the components that includes, and I do share that. But I find that if I have an opportunity to talk with someone and find out what their exact goals and objectives and what their budget is, I can see how we can work with them to deliver what they need um, at the most cost effect in the most cost effective way. So we don't post our pricing more because I agree with Jen, it's good to be transparent, but our services are very customized. So it would be hard to do that. It is in some cases, um, definitely. And I wind up, you know, everybody needs something different. So usually by the time we get to the conversation, it isn't exactly what they saw online. And, you know, like you said, they don't always know what they need. Um, but I like starting with at least that ballpark for conversation sake so that they know a little bit. Um, you know, I always want to know when I walk into a conversation every close. And it's something that I bring up with clients is that very few people really like or are willing to talk about money and I always tell them look you know because I, I very rarely ever had somebody when I asked them what their budget was I actually gave me a number 
Um, and so you start sort of blind with your proposal or your pricing or whatever you do, thinking, I have no idea if this is going to completely blow them out of the water or what was in their head because they gave me no input as far as what they're thinking budget wise. Um, and so I tell all of my clients, and I will write it straight into a proposal that I write for them. My initial proposal to you and my estimate is the first talking point. This is the beginning of a conversation. This is not my final answer. This is to get the ball rolling so that you have an idea of what I'm thinking of doing for you that I think will help based on what you told me, which you can tell me I got something wrong um, and we can change it. You can say, wow, this is way out of my budget. And we can talk about then maybe once you've seen my number, you're willing to then put a number on the table too. And we can see then how we can tweak things so that we can get to that place in the middle. Um, or we can say, you know, this really isn't what I expected at all, and there's no more conversation to be had. But I usually try to approach it as let this be the starting point of our conversation because you didn't give me much input from the beginning. And I'm trying to just assess what it is you're telling me about what you need and how much of my time I think that's going to take. And some people can do that, and some people can't. Some people will read it and either make a yes or no decision. Um, to hire or not to hire, um, other people will actually process that and say, okay, let's figure out where some of the differences are, or they may just say yes. Um, but it, yeah, it always, I guess, because I'm not one of those people who's shy about money, it surprises me no one will ever, <laughs> no one will ever come forth. <laughs> you know, if you ask me what I want to spend on something, I'll tell you. <laughs> And it's not always free. I, I believe people deserve to get paid. And I like having people around me who are really good at what they do. So I would never say, oh, you know, I'd love to have your services, but I'm hoping you'll give it to me for free. Um, and I like working with people like that too, people who value expertise and having someone around them who brings something to the table. You know, if I'm going to hire you to do something I can do, that's not as valuable to me as hiring you to do something that either I hate doing <laughs> I can't do, or I'm just not good at. Um, those are the people that I want. And the ones that I know, I think as we all mentioned, who get referred to me from others that I value and respect and trust. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, I think we all want clients like that, don't we? The ones we value and trust and respect who value and trust and respect our judgment and our expertise and are willing to pay for it. Um, so I'm hoping all of your 2022 is with clients like that. <laughs> Show your value proposition to people who get it. Um, I know we've gone way over and thank you so much for sticking with me. I know some people had to drop off there, but I think it's been a great discussion. Does anyone have any last questions or thoughts? Um, there's so much chat here. And I think if I'm not mistaken, that each one of you can download the chat if you want to. So I'm gonna leave it here as, as people are still hopping off. I'll make sure I'm the last one to hop off so that if you wanted to download that, you can. Um, but are there any other last thoughts or questions? I wanna thank you thank all you, so much. And especially Caitlin who had to jump off and Liz and Ruby, thank you so much for coming and helping lead this discussion. Your insight is invaluable. And I wish all of you a happy and safe and hopefully somewhat warm 2022. <laughs> Thank you Bye for everybody. having me. Thank you. Great Great thank you, everyone. Jen. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you Bye. so Bye. much. Great to be here today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, Bye, everyone. Bye. So it's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's good. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I can't wait to see you next week. Yes, we'll chat some more. Yes. yes. I'm going to make and great tips about pricing because that's my thing where I'm like, oh. <laughs> but